Okay, very good. So, um, so I'll, uh, so this course uh, is a course on, uh, which is introductory course on uh, mathematical economics. And uh, <clears throat> so the idea of this course uh, is to give you a, a sense of uh, how you can use or how economists have been using uh, mathematics to uh, model economic behavior. And um, so let me uh, tell you how this uh, work, uh, how this course will work. So first of all, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, material on this website uh, where you will find uh, um, some background material and some uh, uh, video lecture for uh, uh, some short video for each of the uh, topics uh, that we will uh, that, that we will cover in this course. So uh, today, every lecture that we will do, we will deal with one of these uh, 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 topics. And uh, the, the last lecture, uh, we will uh, maybe uh, make a summary or cover some uh, extra material. So um, the idea is that uh, you look at uh, this uh, uh, material and the, uh, and the lectures, uh, the video lectures uh, uh, before uh, the uh, lecture every day, every time. And then uh, we go, uh, during the lecture, we go over this material. Uh, we I, I will summarize this content uh, and then uh, you will have the question, we will have the question to discuss this material. We will have a possibility to ask questions and, uh, uh, and to discuss them. Okay, so today uh, we are going to uh, discuss uh, the introductory part and uh, uh, individual rationality. Okay, so the first uh, comment I would like to make uh, is that uh, economics uh, is uh, very different uh, uh, from physics. Uh, so when you try to model uh, uh, economic system, a system where there are uh, in agents, uh, uh, rational or intelligent agents, then you can think uh, uh, that you have to uh, realize that some uh, of uh, the features that we are uh, used to when we deal with uh, natural systems, with physical systems, do not work. So the first one is that uh, um, economic actors uh, uh, have a forward-looking behavior. So in the sense that uh, um, uh, in, uh, in any particular situation, so um, an intelligent actor will try to forecast or to uh, uh, predict what will happen in the future and, uh, um, and take actions in such a way as to uh, uh, achieve uh, a particular uh, goal. So this means that uh, uh, when we write down equations uh, uh, in physics, uh, these equations are typically forward equations. That is, you specify the state of a system at a given time, and then you have to, equations that tell you how the behavior of the system will evolve uh, uh, from that state onward. In economic, uh, uh, in an economic situation, sometimes you, you can have a situation where there is an economic agent that wants to satisfy a certain goal at a certain time. And then the type of uh, equations that you solve are forward, are backward equations, backward in time to understand what is the action that you need to do now in order to achieve a, a result uh, later. So in this sense, uh, 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 economic theory, so the type of theories that you have in economics are not, uh, there is no causality. 
and um, uh, and also uh, there is uh, uh, non-locality of say interactions. The second uh, a big uh, 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 say thing that one has to realize is that uh, um, uh, in physics we are used to uh, characterize uh, the behavior of a system as an optimization problem over a function be it uh, the Hamiltonian, the actions, uh, the free energy or whatever. So you have a, you have a function and, uh, and then the state of the system can be defined in terms of uh, uh, the maximization. So each degree of freedom maximizes the same function. In economics instead, uh, you have that different agents maximize different actions and the resulting behavior, um, the resulting state of the system is characterized by the combined uh, maximization of different objective functions. And these may, may result uh, in very different uh, uh, type of behavior and, uh, and, and the result can also be uh, quite uh, different from uh, say, what would be called a social optimum, okay? In particular, uh, um, in physics, uh, because uh, um, we know that, say, for example, if uh, the interaction is an interaction that only depends on, uh, say, the difference of uh, positions, for example, in physics, uh, then you know that there is a law of uh, 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 reciprocal reactions that the, the force that is acting on uh, particle uh, uh, two because of particle one is the inverse of the force that is acting on particle one because of particle two. Okay, so this is uh, this will not be true in economics uh, in general. The last point I want to make about this is uh, uh, that uh, um, in physics. Uh, we are interested uh, in finding mathematical model that describe what is going on you know, on the system that you are studying. So this is called a positive approach or a descriptive approach. And uh, in economics instead, uh, of course one wants to, uh, one is interested in economic system because of a positive approach, but uh, also, uh, uh, one is also interested in understanding how the system should be in order to achieve certain uh, uh, objectives of say fairness or uh, efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. So this is called a normative approach. Okay, and say, if you want um, uh, the normative part of physics is what uh, is called uh, engineering. Okay, so uh, in, in economics, you have both these two type of uh, emphasis on both approaches. Okay, so let me uh, uh, start by uh, saying why do we uh, 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 in, insist on uh, rationality? So uh, on the website, you find uh, uh, a paper that gives you a background uh, on what does really this assumption of rationality means? Uh, uh, does it, uh, uh, what are the, uh, are we really thinking uh, that uh, uh, the Russian, the economic actors uh, are behaving in a rational way? Is this an assumption of their psychology or, 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 or what? So um, this is a very interesting discussion, but we will not enter into this discussion. We just treat rationality as a working hypothesis because essentially it is a, a very, um, so it is, a, it is an hypothesis that allows us to model individual behavior and to model the behavior of interacting individuals. And uh, there is a single way to be rational there are many, many ways to be irrational. So um, at least the theory of uh, economics under the assumption of rationality gives you a, a benchmark over which you can uh, uh, 
then uh, uh, compare real behavior what, with what would be predicted by uh, rationality. So we will consider rationality as a working uh, hypothesis. So um, then why is uh, this uh, rationality so important uh, uh, for uh, uh, economists? So it is important because of what uh, 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 economists call um, uh, uh, micro foundation. That is in any uh, uh, economic phenomenon, they want to understand uh, what is the uh, underlying uh, uh, cause in the individual behavior that results in an aggregate behavior. Okay, so let me uh, make this point uh, by discussing uh, the uh, problem of uh, the wealth inequality. Okay, you may know that uh, um, the uh, so wealth is very unequally distributed in society. So there is a, a, um, a small part, a small fraction of people that own a large fraction of the total wealth in an economy. So that if you look at uh, the distribution of how much wealth do uh, uh, in say uh, how many individuals have a certain level of wealth, you find what is called uh, a, a Pareto distribution, which is essentially a power law distribution. It's a very broad distribution. And uh, it's essentially, if you plot it in a log log scale, you find a straight line. So this uh, finding uh, was first uh, 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 derived by uh, Wilfredo Pareto. And uh, at his time, he had a, a big problem in trying to convince uh, his colleagues uh, that this was uh, an important finding. And the reason was that uh, at that time, uh, economics was not really a mathematical science. It was mostly part of, uh, um, uh, I mean, economics was part of uh, uh, law. And uh, so the normative aspect of economics uh, was uh, uh, very, uh, very much uh, um, uh, prominent. And so uh, when uh, economists uh, uh, read uh, uh, Pareto's paper uh, on these new theories of economics, uh, where he was finding this uh, uh, distribution, very broad distribution of wealth, uh, they were thinking of what are the moral underpinning. I mean, they were thinking this was a moral statement uh, uh, about society, but he was just uh, uh, pointing out uh, a, a fact, a fact which had to do with uh, measurement, with an, say empirical measurement, and, um, and 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 that needed to be uh, say understood. And uh, so there's been a lot of work uh, on trying to understand what this uh, uh, wealth uh, uh, distribution what could give rise to this wealth distribution. In particular, physicists have been working a lot on this. And, um, and there is a book uh, which essentially summarizes uh, what physicists have done. And they were able to reproduce uh, the empirical distribution of wealth in different countries with very, very simple model which just more or less assume that uh, people meet at random and when they meet, uh, they, they will trade for something. Uh, so they will exchange some money and uh, uh, someone will get a little bit more rich. Someone, someone will get a little bit more poor, but uh, you, you need to make very little assumptions in order to recover this uh, empirical finding. Now, this finding did, didn't really have a lot of impact uh, in uh, economics. Uh, and the reason is precisely because, uh, uh, well, they don't uh, uh, tell you anything uh, 
on what are the incentives, what is the mechanism uh, in, the, in the behavior of people, in, in the behavior of the agents uh, that gives rise uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this particular uh, behavior here. Instead, the subject became uh, very much uh, a hot topic uh, when uh, this book by Thomas Piketty came out. And uh, this is the capital in the 21st century. And uh, well, first of all, uh, it came out because inequality is on the rise, is really uh, rising a lot. And uh, second, because uh, it was explaining what are the mechanisms that are uh, responsible for this behavior and how, uh, what type of uh, my macroeconomic measures could uh, tame uh, this type of problem. And, um, and so, uh, so this should give you an example of what is the difference uh, between uh, a physicist approach and uh, an economics, an economist approach. Okay, having said this, uh, uh, so um, I would like to just pause for uh, questions. If there are uh, questions from uh, any of you, on this first part. So this is the way I want to organize these uh, lectures by uh, discussing, uh, reviewing a little bit of material and then uh, seeing whether uh, everybody, everybody is with me or if you have questions. Just uh, turn off your mic and uh, ask a question if you have any. Yes, there is a question in the chat. Ah, okay. So, okay. So, um, so why do we see this inequality within wealth distribution as a problem? Okay, so uh, this is a very important question, and um, uh, so one. Uh, main idea is that essentially uh, in an economy, what you care about is that essentially um, uh, there is a um, circulation of uh, wealth and goods, okay? And uh, so, and this is what is called the GDP. GDP measures uh, how many uh, goods are produced and uh, um, and exchanged in an economy, okay? So when the economy, uh, when the, finan the, the financial uh, um, 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 when the finance of an economy, when the wealth in an economy becomes uh, concentrated in very few individuals, then this wealth uh, does not circulate in the economy. And then uh, the economy does not work properly in the sense that there are a lot of people who would like to buy stuff, but they do not have money. And there are people who uh, have much more money uh, than what they need to buy the stuff they need. And, uh, and this is a problem because the, the economy gets stuck and you get uh, 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 a recession. So this is one argument against uh, uh, inequality. The other argument, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, maybe more um, uh, sociological is that uh, uh, the more unequal society, uh, the more you have the risk of uh, serious unrest like revolutions or things like this. And um, uh, of course, the real question is, uh, well, how much is, uh, uh, when does inequality becomes too large? Uh, when, uh, uh, when it becomes, uh, uh, when it is uh, uh, 
when it is okay. And uh, this issue is, this question is a quantitative question that, for example, um, uh, we have addressed uh, in one of our papers. And what we find is that when the uh, slope of this, uh, when the exponent of this Pareto distribution becomes so such that uh, the expected value of the wealth distribution of the wealth under this distribution diverges, then uh, uh, essentially the economy stops. Economic exchanges uh, they they come to a halt. Uh, excuse okay. me, professor. Yeah. Can I can I ask a question? Yes, please. So so if I'm understanding well, you're talking about uh, people from the more humanist perspective. People are more interested. People are more, um, let's say, influenced from an emotional point of view uh, by the relative inequality as opposed to the absolute like that's, that's wealth. So, uh, so you can be like poor in a poor environment and still be like kind of cool, like kind of OK. Yes, but then that, you could also be relatively well off in a very wealthy place and still be unhappy. So that was one thing. And then also uh, regarding the burrito law. Um, do you know any instances, maybe like, um, is it a law that maybe is um, kind of, that holds in all the sectors where maybe um, creative production of people is uh, the main factor? Because something that comes to mind is like uh, bestsellers. Uh, a lot of people uh, write books, but only a small proportion of them are successful and then of those successful, only a small proportion of them. Yeah, so this is... So, uh, do you know uh, any, anything these about opens, that? Uh, this opens, Carlo, a very, very long discussion on uh, what are the feedbacks uh, in different systems uh, and um, what are the returns in different sectors. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting discussion, but uh, we cannot uh, uh, go into it. So okay. um, there are other questions in the chat. Uh, let me go. Uh, uh, through this, and then we'll uh, go back uh, uh, to the lecture because otherwise. So, uh, in the first slide, we have seen economics is not equal to physics, uh, but the economics has a huge role to play in society. So, today, are going to study about the impact of economics in the day-to-day -day life or the adjacent role uh, with the physics. So, I don't know if I understand well this question, but essentially. Um, we are not going to solve any real problem, but I think it is important uh, uh, to understand uh, uh, what, are, what is the theory of economics uh, in order to uh, think about these problems in a more disciplined manner. Okay, so then there is another uh, question. Uh, are there any alternatives to assuming agent rationality uh, when trying to mathematically model the economical system. There are many alternatives uh, and, and there is a lot of research going on. Uh, there are fields uh, that are called behavioral economics uh, and uh, uh, there is also a field that is trying to relate uh, uh, economic behavior with neuroscience, uh, which is called neuroeconomics. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on. Um, uh, yes, but doesn't that make money worthless if everyone possesses approximately the same wealth? Uh, well, not necessarily. Okay, so um, there is another big issue here. Um, what is really money? Uh, and uh, I think we will discuss about this. Uh, we should understand what money is uh, in order to answer this question. Um, uh, uh, so physics uh, uh, can be categorized as, uh, in terms of normative approach. Yes, uh, if you want to make an airplane fly, then uh, you need a normative ac approach. And uh, uh, and that is called engineering, essentially. 
Thus, palidodistribution has a, a heavy or fat tail. It has a fat tail. So, uh, Pareto distribution, a fat tail or heavy tail distribution. Um, um, uh, uh, yes, okay. So, then there are also theories on uh, uh, networks. Uh, uh, in economic or say network theory is more and more used in economic theory. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, we are going to uh, enter into this uh, thing. There are also people thinking about uh, uh, introducing uh, altruistic behavior in economics, uh, but we are not going to talk about this. Um, and um, uh, so for the sake of uh, time, I, I think I should go on with, uh, um, with, the, with the presentation. So let me go back uh, to my slides. I'm happy, thank you very much for all these questions. And uh, I think this makes uh, our Spring College a little bit uh, uh, interactive. Okay, so let's uh, uh, think about Excuse modeling. Uh, Excuse uh, the pressure. Yeah. Can I, so there's the la, there's the last question, and I'd be I'd be kind of interested in knowing if you think it's relevant to our further discussion. It's could you please explain normative approach in short? Uh, if it's relevant to our discussion, could you please do that? Yes, yeah. we are mostly going to deal with uh, um, a positive approach. We are mostly dealing with uh, um, describing uh, economic behavior. So the normative approach is, is mostly related with uh, uh, what, how should the society be? Okay, so what is a good measure of uh, welfare? Okay, how do you measure, uh, say, efficiency in a society? Okay, and um, <clears throat> so uh, these are um, subjects uh, that you deal with in a normative, uh, in the normative approach. Okay, so let me <coughs> get to uh, modeling uh, a, a rational individual. So, uh, the, uh, so we start by saying that, uh, um, uh, so being rational mean, uh, means uh, making uh, rational choices, okay? And uh, there is uh, one way to, uh, so the first thing you have to uh, decide is uh, what are you choosing? And so the first element uh, is you have to define what is the set of alternatives. And we will call this X. And then uh, on this uh, uh, set, uh, or actually on the direct product of this set with itself, uh, we define a preference relation uh, in this way. Uh, that means uh, uh, with this way of writing, we mean that X is at least as good as Y. So uh, there are other uh, relations that you can define, binary relations. So one is the strict preference, which means, which is equivalent to saying that X is at least as good as Y, but Y is not at least as good as X. And this preference relation is uh, irreflexive in the sense that uh, uh, X uh, cannot be strictly preferred to X. And then there is the indifference relation, which means that uh, uh, if X is at least as good as Y uh, and Y is at least as good as X, then uh, uh, this uh, individual under this preference relation is indifferent uh, between X and Y. And this relation is reflexive in the sense that X uh, is at least as good, is, uh, in, uh, is equivalent to X. So then uh, what we say is that uh, um, a preference relation is rational if it is complete, which means that uh, for any two alternative, uh, either X is at least as good as Y or Y is at least as good as X or both. Uh, um, and so that for any two choices, uh, for any two alternative, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is your preference relation. The second uh, uh, 
a hypothesis that makes a preference relation rational is transitivity. That is, if you have three choices, X, Y, and Z, then if X is at least as good as Y and uh, Y is at least as good as Z, then X is also at least as good as Z. Now these two um, uh, uh, properties of uh, uh, the preference relation, of course, uh, imply similar proper, uh, properties for the strict preference relation and for the indifference relation, okay? So for example, the indifference relation is also uh, transitive. Okay, so um, now one has to realize that these two hypotheses are rather strong in the sense, so they, they look like natural, but they are rather strong. In the sense that uh, in real life, uh, uh, well, uh, um, the fact that you, an individual has uh, a complete uh, preference relation on all possible alternatives he can choose, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, not very clear. I mean, think of when you go to the supermarket and you have to uh, choose uh, brand uh, X or brand Y of a certain good, then, uh, uh, well, uh, maybe you, you have to think uh, hard about uh, uh, whether you prefer X to Y. It's not uh, immediately apparent. And also, uh, transitivity is, um, is, not, uh, uh, is a strong assumption because uh, normally when you compare X to Y, you do that uh, consider a certain uh, number of factors. And when you co compare Y to Z, you may consider a different set of factors. And when you compare X to Z, you may consider a, a yet different uh, set of factors. Okay, so the fact that uh, um, you, the, uh, your individual preference relation is transitive is, uh, um, uh, is a strong assumption. Also, there is, a, uh, there is another aspect uh, that uh, uh, by which transitivity is a big assumption, which is uh, essentially what is called uh, uh, just perceivable differences. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you may want to choose, when you have to choose uh, uh, a real number in a continuum spectrum, then of course, uh, between any two points which are very close, uh, you may be indifferent, okay? And then uh, if you are indifferent between close points, uh, then uh, if you apply transitivity, it means that uh, you are indifferent also between the extremes. But of course, uh, uh, maybe between the extremes, uh, you are not indifferent, okay? So think of uh, uh, when you want to paint, uh, choose a color to paint your room. There are many shades uh, of that color that go from black to white. And, uh, and you may be indifferent between slightly different uh, shades, but definitely uh, you are not indifferent between uh, black and white. Okay, so uh, this was uh, the other, um, um, other questions on this subject, on this uh, part. Um, uh, can you give an example when a preference relation is not complete? So when a preference relation is not complete, uh, is we will discuss this. Uh, uh, so you have to think uh, that uh, uh, this preference relation, and we'll come back to this, is an uh, unobserved uh, quantity is something that we assume uh, is in the back of the mind of, of the economic agent, okay, of the individual. But it's actually uh, not uh, uh, something uh, that is directly measurable, okay? 
So um, you again, you can think at yourself uh, when uh, you go to a supermarket uh, and uh, uh, think about uh, um, uh, what type of uh, a particular good uh, you want to buy when there are many, many brands, okay? And uh, so it's, uh, I mean, if you think about it, uh, uh, then if you, pay, if you compare two brands, one with the other, and you can do the exercise and you can uh, then ask yourself uh, whether your preference is transitive or not, okay? Um, and this is, yes, uh, this is why essentially completeness is a strong assumption, is a strong assumption, especially when the number of alternatives uh, becomes very large, okay? Um, and sorry, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I still don't understand this. I mean, when you have two prefer, I mean, two uh, key voltage. Uh, what is it called? Um, two alternatives. Either they will be equally good. I mean, you either you are indifferent indifferent to them, or there is a strict. I mean, there is some key uh, preference relation. So, I mean, complete would mean you have all these choices, right? It can be uh, like. There is some preference between X and Y, or there is no, there is indifference. So I mean, that are, that are the only choices, yes. right? So I mean, completeness, uh, completeness, uh, incompleteness means uh, that this uh, um, uh, relation between uh, this pairwise relation is not defined for all pairs. There is some pair X and uh, X and Y for which. Uh, the uh, preference relation is not defined. Okay. Oh, uh, but you saying we can't? Uh, okay, there is no. Okay, okay. But that seems. Uh, why is that? I mean, you can always have a uh, some model which will define this is preferred than the other alternative, right? Uh, yep. How how are you saying that it's not defined? No, no, I mean, uh, uh, say, now we are thinking about modeling uh, an individual, how an individual makes choices. And uh, we have to take into account the fact that uh, this individual may not have a complete preference relation on all possible alternatives. And okay, okay. Uh, this example of the supermarket, when you enter into the supermarket, you see all the alternatives that you have, but uh, yes. you enter into the supermarket without having, uh, say, hard, uh, like in your hardware, like uh, uh, a preference relation over all these alternatives. Okay, so you, I mean, if you work uh, a little bit, maybe you come up, come out with a preference relation over all these alternatives. But even uh, the choice that you make at the supermarket uh, is a choice that, uh, well, you may choose to, to buy one of these brands uh, without the need uh, of having a complete preference relation overall, okay? In the sense that uh, it is enough for you to say that uh, say brand A is better than brand B and brand C, but you don't care about uh, establishing whether B is better than C or not because you just want to buy A, okay? Okay, yeah, thank you, thanks. Okay, uh, so uh, isn't preference relation implicitly dependent on some set of factors? Why should we worry about transitivity of some fixed preference relation being factor dependent or not? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but uh, uh, say um, probably um, we will understand better from a mathematical point of view why transitivity can be lost uh, when we discuss about social choice. Uh, because, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, for example, when uh, when you want to decide about a trip, uh, imagine that uh, now we are in the pandemics, we cannot go on holiday. So 
you, you have to decide whether you want to go in city A or in city B. And this is a complex decision because, uh, well, there is the trip. How are you going to go there? There is a, uh, there is a travel. Are you, I mean, imagine that you are taking a flight. And then there is the hotel. And then there is the uh, amenities. I mean, uh, whether there are, uh, uh, say, good uh, sightseeing in one place or uh, there is the food. There are many aspects. And uh, maybe you, based on the food, uh, you may prefer A to B. But based on, uh, say, the sightseeing, uh, you may prefer B to A. Okay. So, and, and say, how do you decide between A and B and B and C? Uh, well, you, you, you could weight these kind of things differently. Okay. I don't know whether this answers the questions, but. Uh, um, so let me go ahead uh, uh, with the next uh, uh, with the next part. Okay. So uh, now, one important thing is that when you have a preference relation, you can also, in some cases, uh, uh, represent it uh, with uh, with a function. And uh, this is called the utility function. The utility function uh, is a function. Um, so you say that uh, a function u is a utility function that represents a certain uh, preference relation. If uh, whenever x is at least as good as y, then u of x is larger or equal to u of y for all x and y, OK? So this function is a function that is defined on all the alternatives. So that, uh, uh, so, <clears throat> so that uh, this, uh, it is clear that uh, um, if, uh, um, uh, uh, say if a preference relation is represented by utility function, then this preference relation is rational, okay? So any preference relation which is represented by a utility function is rational because it is complete because the utility function is defined on all uh, values of X. And because uh, if X, uh, um, uh, if U of X is larger than U of Y, U of Y is larger than U of Z, then U of X is clearly uh, larger than U of Z. Okay, so it's also, transitive, okay? So um, now the converse uh, is not always true, okay? So uh, which means uh, say, if you have uh, uh, a utility function, then uh, um, uh, does this always uh, represent uh, a, a, a rational preference relation? But one can prove that uh, if the number of alternatives is finite, then the converse uh, is also true. Okay, that uh, 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 a utility function represents uh, a, a rational uh, 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 preference. Okay, now uh, essentially this restriction of, I mean, there are counter example where you have a, a Countably infinite uh, set of choices uh, when uh, uh, essentially uh, <coughs> say uh, transitivity uh, can can break down, but these are rather uh, say uh, pathological cases. Okay, so then uh, this means that essentially we can uh, represent uh, a rational preference in terms of uh, uh, utilities. And uh, so while preferences uh, is an ordinal uh, type of relation between uh, the choices, so you can rank, uh, uh, if you have a preference relation, then you can rank your choices, uh, what is the first, what is the second, et cetera, et cetera. The cardinal, the, the, the utility function is essentially a, a cardinal property. 
cardinal property means that uh, it is expressed by a real number. You could think uh, that uh, if the utility of X is U of X, then U of X tells you how much you like X. Okay, so this is uh, uh, one way of uh, putting, but this also means that uh, the same preference relation, rational preference relation, can be represented by many utility functions. So, for example, if you take a, a, a utility function, which is a, an increasing function of a utility function, then these two utility functions are going to represent uh, the same uh, rational uh, preference relation. Okay. So are there uh, uh, questions on this? I think this is a very simple uh, um, thing, but uh, um, so we have a uh, uh, um, Well, uh, well, a practical example of infinite choices is when, say, for example, uh, the set of alternatives is a continuous uh, set. For example, is uh, say is the real uh, is a point uh, on the real axis. Okay, or say um, it's um, um, yes, yeah, you you have to decide. Uh, uh, yes, for example, uh, what shade of, what color you want to paint uh, your room. Then uh, a color can be represented by three numbers, R, G, and B. And then uh, the choice of a color is, uh, is a choice uh, between uh, a set, uh, which is, say, uh, the positive real, let's say, to the cube, no? And uh, um, uh, so cardinal preference, uh, uh, again, so, so the, what I was saying is that utility function is a cardinal property. Cardinal property uh, means that uh, it is related to a number, a real number, uh, whereas Ordinal properties are related to just uh, a, a ranking, a, say um, a, an ordering of the preferences. And you may express this by saying that uh, utility function expresses uh, how much you like uh, uh, a particular alternative, okay? Uh, Yes, it is correct uh, to say that uh, the utility function is a function to turn our preference into a numerical value that can be that we can work with. That's uh, that's okay. It's a very practical uh, way. But let me uh, let me go to the final point I want Excuse to cover. Me. Yes. So. Uh, you mentioned earlier that for say two elements of uh, x and y of uh, in in the set of alternatives, uh, you can frame you can use different framings to evaluate your preference. So you can use different set of factors to evaluate x and y. How does that tie in with uh, this function u? Okay, so the, the the utility function, as we have said, uh, represents uh, a rational preference okay so it uh, represents a rational preference where these uh, problems of intransitivity are not pre present okay ah. okay okay so let me get uh, to the final uh, point that i want to uh, discuss today which is essentially uh, uh, if you want uh, inverse uh, approach to choice behavior. So up to now, what we have discussed is both preference relation and utility function are unobservable properties. So you cannot, uh, um, how you cannot observe the utility function uh, of a person. 
okay? You cannot really measure it, okay? But what you can measure, what you can observe is actually how uh, it behaves and uh, what are the choices that an individual makes in different uh, circumstances, okay? So this is a different, uh, say, a, a specular approach to uh, um, um, individual rationality that starts from observed behavior. Okay, so now here we have uh, our set of alternatives, X. And between this set of alternatives, uh, we may consider a particular problem where the uh, individual has to choose between uh, a subset B of choices. And uh, when we observe uh, this, uh, uh, this, the, the behavior, the choice that the individual makes, uh, what we see is that uh, among these B alternatives, this uh, uh, subset C uh, is the set of choices uh, that he has chosen. Okay, so we can uh, uh, formalize this uh, by introducing what is called the choice structure. So the choice structure is made of two elements. So one element is uh, this B, which is a family of subsets uh, of uh, uh, X. And you can think uh, at uh, uh, this B as being uh, uh, an observation of uh, an experiment, a, a choice experiment, okay? So these B are also called uh, budget set. That is uh, the set of uh, uh, alternatives which are available in a particular instance, in a particular situation, okay? The second element of a choice structure is a function that maps uh, each uh, uh, budget set, each B, into a subset of, uh, of B, okay? Which is uh, the set of things, uh, uh, the set of alternatives which are chosen uh, in this particular experiment, okay? And of course, this uh, set must be non-empty. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, and, and the idea is that essentially if uh, among uh, all these uh, options, uh, these are the ones that are chosen, then uh, uh, somehow we want to infer that the individual prefer these uh, green alternatives here, contains in C, to alternatives which are in B but not in C. Okay, so for example, these are two uh, possible choice structures. So here you have uh, three elements, this is X. And uh, you can think uh, at a situation where in your budget set, you have either uh, possibility to choose between X, Y, and Z, or the possibility to choose between X and Y. And the first choice behavior, the first uh, say uh, choice structure is a C, where essentially in this case, uh, what is chosen is just X. And also here, what is chosen is just X. Whereas here is, uh, you, uh, in the first case, you choose X and Y. In this case, you just choose X. Okay, so now the relation, is, the, the, the issue is, what is the relation between uh, um, choice structures and preferences, okay? And the idea is that the choice behavior actually may reveal uh, preferences, okay? But in order to do so, the choice structure has to satisfy some consistency requirement, okay? What does consistency mean, okay? So this is a sort of a, um, uh, uh, the, the, this is the uh, subject of the weak axiom of uh, revealed preferences. So the weak axiom of revealed preferences says that essentially that if we observe X, that uh, X is chosen when Y is also available, then uh, uh, X should be chosen whenever X and Y are available and Y is chosen, okay? So you have to think a little bit about uh, uh, this statement. So if, I, uh, if X and Y are available, 
and uh, I'll choose X, then whenever X and Y are also available and I choose Y, then I also should choose X. So, um, <clears throat> so if uh, uh, a choice structure satisfies this weak axiom of revealed preferences, then you can infer a preference relation out of it. So, which is called the revealed preference relation, okay? And you say that uh, X is revealed preferred to Y if uh, uh, there is one uh, uh, budget set that contains X and Y such that X is chosen, okay? So uh, now, of course, if you have a rational preference relation, then uh, uh, even if you choose a subset uh, of uh, budget sets, a uh, family of budget sets, uh, and uh, if you look at what is the C that is uh, induced by this, uh, then uh, uh, this preference, this uh, choice behavior, this choice structure will satisfy the weak axiom or revealed preferences. Okay, the interesting thing is whether the converse is also true or not. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, imagine that you have uh, a, a choice behavior that satisfies the weak axiom or revealed preferences, then uh, does this uh, uh, correspond to a revealed preference relation that is rational? And the answer is yes, but in order for, uh, for it to be true, then the uh, set B should include all subsets, all sets with at least uh, three elements, okay? So to make uh, this content of this weak axiom or reveal preference uh, 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 clear, so let's make a simple uh, example. Let's go back to these two examples and let's see uh, whether these two uh, um, choice structures uh, satisfy the weak axiom of reveal preferences. So, uh, so in this case, uh, if you consider C1, you see that there is a, a set, which is this B here, where uh, X is preferred, is, is in C, okay? Belongs to, to C, okay? And there is another set where uh, uh, X and Y are also present and, um, and X uh, is, is also there, okay? So this uh, uh, C1 uh, is, uh, uh, is a structure that uh, obeys the weak axiom of uh, revealed preference. This one instead is not, okay? Because, uh, um, uh, so because essentially, um, um, Think of why, okay? So in this case, y was selected and x was also available, okay? Then uh, it should be that whenever x and y are available and x is chosen, then y should also be chosen. But that is not true, okay? So C2 does not obey the weak axiom of reveal preference. Okay, so um, of course, say this means that uh, uh, say there is a revealed preference relation in this choice structure C1. There is no revealed, uh, so this uh, choice behavior here is not consistent with a preference relation in the case of uh, uh, C2. Okay, so uh, questions. Can we say, that, in other words, that uh, um, rational behavior is a fixed rule behavior uh, at any uh, choices? Uh, there is a fixed rule uh, for individual individual in choosing. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, uh, it's a fix in which sense? In the sense that uh, you are considering a, a, a time. I mean, different choices in time, or are you considered that 
preference uh, could change in time or, or or something like that yes yeah so so yes we are considering a very simple case where uh, as the preference relation is just we are uh, we want to model uh, the choice behavior in a particular instance and for that we assume that there is a preference relation okay thank you okay so uh, so of course uh, all these things uh, um, uh, okay uh, well, why we consider subset inside x because x is the set of all alternative uh, so so th there is we are only considering alternatives in x x is the set of all possible alternatives so dns asks uh, uh, should the utility function always be a continuous function? No, it should not. Uh, there is no need for it to be a continuous function. Is it correct to say that U of X is a, uh, I guess this, this we already answered. Um, uh, so what if uh, C of B is equal to B? This is a very interesting uh, uh, question from uh, Fabio. Uh, so what uh, would you, uh, so, for example, if all elements, uh, if one is indifferent between all elements of B, then uh, C of B will be equal to B. Okay. So, but again, uh, the, the issue about uh, choice structure is that we describe uh, uh, the observed behavior. Okay. And then uh, uh, from this, we want to infer. Uh, preferences. Okay, so our time is, uh, is over. So tomorrow we will discuss uh, the uh, choice under uncertainty. Uh, I recommend you to go and uh, look at the lectures on the website so that uh, we can have a similar, uh, we can have a, we can go through this material uh, tomorrow. Excuse so, me, Professor. Yeah. Uh, I'm Butano. Sorry for the silly question, but uh, we as um, PGS students uh, have exams at the end of the spring college, right? Yes. What kind of exams? Okay, so let me stop recording because this is not of interest uh, to anyone. Um...